hundred subscribers. So I want you to show five records, um, uh, five records, five CDs, five singles, five eight tracks. I don't care. Or talk about five things. It doesn't really matter. That remind you in some way of people that you love and care yeah. about. I know it's cheesy. You didn't expect this from that fat PBR drinking sack of trash in Columbus, Ohio. But you're done. Who? What? Huh? <laughs> Hi, everyone. Music is a journey. Peter Scove here, and I was just looking at a video there from Alex at Beer and Vinyl, and he is coming up to 500 subscribers. He's been going since October last year, so that's pretty darn good because I think it took me five years to clear 500 subscribers. He's done it in about five or six months. Amazing. So he must be doing something really right, and I must have been doing something different. So uh, if you heard, what he's saying is he's got a thread or a contest. It seems to be pretty loose. Um, you got to show five albums or five singles or five CDs or five eight tracks or five gramophone recordings. I don't know, whatever. Um, songs or albums that remind you of someone that you love. All right. So this was actually pretty easy. I, I watched the video yesterday. I already made my list. So I'm going to do that exactly. And this falls in pretty nicely because, as usual, I've got a story to tell. I have always have a story to tell, which is why my videos get so long. But as it so happens, two weeks earlier, I watched a video at the YouTube channel During the Meanwhilst. That is actually a photography channel. However, the guy there, Nick, hi Nick, he often... often he occasionally does videos about music, talking about albums as well, and he's a... A rocker guy too likes his stuff a little bit on the heavy side so um yeah uh, he had a great video there where he talked about five albums that were related to some memory in his life and then he talked about some photographs that were related to some memory in his life and I was thinking that was a really cool idea it was an interesting way to get to know about him a little bit more personally so this is a wonderful tie-in then because I'm going to talk about five albums or songs that tie into five people in my life that are near and dear to me. Um, well, actually, the last one is kind of broad. We'll, we'll see, we'll see. So let's get started here. When I was in the 10th grade, my English teacher was a really cool teacher. I think every student who had him as a teacher liked him. And our assignment in grade 10 was to bring a song to class, have the lyrics written out so we could put it on the overhead projector. You would introduce the band, give a little bit of their history. Then you would play the song with the lyrics up for everyone to see. And at the end of it, you would give a brief explanation of what you think the song is about. And then you would ask three questions to your classmates. And I thought this was really great. So I picked for, for my pick was the song Winds of Change from YNT's 1982 album, Black Tiger. I remember another guy picked uh, Heavens on Fire by Kiss, which was kind of funny because after the song was over, then he said, so this song is about a guy who likes a girl a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Well, Winds of Change is, uh, if you know it, uh, if you don't know it, it's a slower song. It's like a ballad, but it's not a, a love song. It's about looking to improve your life situation, getting away from the life that holds you in, holds you down, uh, breaking free, finding the courage to get out there and make something uh, grand with your life. Now, how this ties into a person in my life, it is not about my English teacher, but around the time that I had to do this assignment, my mother became ill with pneumonia and she was bedridden for at least a few days, if not several. And every day I would come home from school, my parents' bedroom was down the hall onto the left, whereas mine was straight ahead. So basically the rooms were joined by one wall. So every time I went to my room, I would always stop in and see how my mom was doing and often she was sleeping. But when I came home from class or from school that day and I told her I did my presentation and what it was about, she said, can I hear the song? And this was a, a big thing for me because my mom listened to Paul Anka, Tom Jones, Engelbert, Humperdinck, as well as lots of jazz like Louis Armstrong and classical. And she did not have any interest in my music. Uh, of course, as I mentioned in my F-bomb video, she was quite shocked when she came into my room and heard David Lee Roth 
using the F word in a song. She was also concerned of me listening to Grim Reaper when they were singing See You in Hell, my friends, See You in Hell. But um, it was, yeah, important for me then. I felt that she asked me to play the song. And it is a beautiful song. And I told her what it was about. And she told me afterwards. It's a very nice song. So that was really a cool thing for me. Now, um, that is not like the fondest memory of my mother in my life. My mother has been absolutely fantastic throughout my life. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing her next year for her 90th birthday. But to tie in uh, a song that I like to my mother, um, my pick was Winds of Change from YNT for the reason of the story I just told you. Okay, next up talked about my mom, we're going to talk about my dad. So this is an album by a band called Carabao, and Carabao in the studio is actually one man. Oliver Rusing in Germany, he plays everything. He writes the songs, he sings, he plays the guitar, bass, keyboards. He started out as a drummer when this was a studio band, but the band slowly broke apart until finally only Oliver remained. He actually does invite guests in to appear on his albums, and he does have a live band. Um, I'm not sure if they've come around to actually recording in the studio together. But anyway, this, is album, this album is called Addicted. It's from 2014, and the final song on the back is... Well, you can't really see it, but anyway, it's 916. Now, this song always caught my attention. First of all, it's a bit of a longer track. How long is it? It's, uh, it's uh, I think it's 8 minutes and 26 seconds. Uh, it's kind of in two parts, but it's also, um, let's see, Carabao is a melodic rock band with some progressive leanings here and there. Um, and this song is one of the ones that features the progressive side a little bit more. And uh, the second half is a very beautiful acoustic part. And I've always had an interest in this song uh, because 916, September 16th, is my father's birthday. So I've always liked that song for that. However, in 2019, my father, well, I guess he was getting old and I don't know, he just decided he was going to stop eating. Now, I was going to visit him at the end of, visit my parents at the end of March in 2019. But in February, my mom said, your father's in the hospital. His situation is not looking good. If you can come now, you should. And I hadn't applied for my new passport yet. So there was this big rush process to get the passport done, get a ticket and get over there and see my dad in the hospital. Fortunately, he did actually get back um, to eating again and he was able to return home and he was doing okay. And so that the second time I came to visit, he was actually doing a lot better. And so I kind of felt like, okay, whatever it was, we were getting over it. But soon after I returned to Japan, my mom told me my father was not eating again and that he was wasting away and that finally he had to actually be sent over to a care place, a care facility where he, um, you know, spent the, the, the last days of his life. So my mom said, don't come over and see him because you will not recognize him. He is just so thin and weak now. So just remember him as you saw him when you last visited, when he was at home and he was smiling and he was speaking to people and he was able to move around. So yeah, uh, my father then passed away in May of 2019. And some months after that, I was listening to the song 916 as I was walking home. And I looked up at the stars and I was listening to the lyrics in that second part. And I thought, yeah, I really feel this song matches perfectly well me thinking about my dad right now. And almost like a coincidence, a day or two later, Oliver Rusing on his Facebook page posted about the song 916. And he said, this song is a song dedicated to his father, written for his father, and his father passed away on the date of September 16th. So, um... That was uh, an extraordinary thing for me because, as I said, 916, my father's birthday, my father passing away, me listening to the song, thinking about the lyrics, how much I felt they, they meant to me. And, uh, and it's exactly because the songwriter wrote the song for his deceased father. So that was a really cool thing. Um, still love the song, one of my favorite Carabao songs. And uh, that's the story behind that one. That's for my dad. Okay, next up, we're going to take a look at Matthew Goodband with Beautiful Midnight. Uh, when did this go back to? 19... Oh, I can't see. 1986 or 89. I can never see the 6 or... No. 
1996 or 98. That's what I'm trying to say. 96 or 98. Now, the reason why this album is very special to me is because my oldest friend, and by that I mean the friend I have known the longest in my life, is a, a woman named Yvonne. And we started out uh, in kindergarten together when we were five years old. So, um, from kindergarten, we continued always being in the same class together up till junior high school. And then, I don't remember, I don't think we were in that many classes together through junior high and high, but of course we always knew each other. And after we went our separate ways after high school, we didn't see each other for a while, but then we, we got in contact again and we've just been in touch ever since. Every time I go back to Canada, she is one of the two people I never miss meeting up with. I always have to meet her and my best friend. So I meet her and her, her family. Um, yeah, and so when we were growing up, growing up, uh, going to school together, our musical tastes were very different. I certainly know that by grade eight, I know that she liked Corey Hart, whereas I was more into Venom. Uh, very different tastes. However, after I moved to Japan, she she we, she always writes me like a, an actual handwritten letter, and she asked me like, I know, okay, I know you're listening to Sloan and the Tea Party these days, but do you ever listen to Matthew Good? Now, I'd heard a song of Matthew Good's back in the latter half of the 90s, and I didn't really care for it all that much. And my best friend, he liked it and couldn't understand why I didn't like it. So my friend Yvonne said, okay, well, he's my favorite artist, and I've seen him in concert a few times, so I'll send you his latest album, which at the time was this one. I think it was. Well, anyway, this is the one she sent me. And I thought, wow, this is this really hit me at the right time. This is a great album. There are so many cool songs on here that I like. So thanks to her sending me this, I got into Matthew Good. I bought the other albums. My best friend was like, well, I thought you never liked him. Why do you like him now? Well, because I heard other songs. <laughs> That's why. So yeah, um, later on, he actually did a Beautiful Midnight Revisited album, which was, I think, four or five tracks. And Yvonne sent me that as well. So anyway, for my oldest friend and one of my dearest friends in my life, Matthew Good Band, Beautiful Midnight. This is the copy that she sent me way back around 2000 or something. Okay, so my best friend. Of course, I have to talk about my best friend. I had for the first few years of my school uh, life, best friends. I had a best friend across the street and later on I had another best friend and I had a, there were every, almost every year there was one boy that I played with more than other boys. But somewhere around the fourth grade, I met up with this guy named Eugene and we started hanging out together and we started playing together and within two or three years he was the guy that I played with the most and we went through our teen years going off to record stores and cassette stores together, riding bikes around, doing all sorts of crazy stuff together anyway. And our musical taste was pretty much like a Venn diagram where the connected part in the middle, that would have been like um, a lot of the glam bands like uh, Motley Crue, Cinderella, whatever. And uh, we liked a lot of the thrash bands. We liked a lot of the more traditional metal bands. We liked Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, Accept, Scorpions, that kind of thing. Y&T. I think he was the only other kid in my school who listened to Y&T. And uh, then on the other side where we did not overlap, he liked more glam stuff than I did. I couldn't get into it to the extent he did, but then I liked some of the more extreme stuff as well as a lot more of the 60s and 70s. I think he liked Aerosmith in Boston and that was about it for 70s stuff for him. So we went to, I think most of the concerts I saw in the 1980s, Judas Priest and Pink Floyd were with other people, but any other concert I went to in the 80s was with him. And one of the memorable ones was going to see Boston for their third stage tour. And I remember they came, uh, Tom Schultz had his leg in a cast. He had this big smile on his face all night long. My guitar teacher, our guitar teacher, also went to the concert. He was a huge Boston fan. And I remember him saying to me later on during a guitar lesson about Ch Tom Schultz being on painkillers and having this big cheesy grin on his face the whole night. Anyway, at the end of the show, my friend said to me, Eugene said to me, he heard from a friend of his that if you go around the back of the building where the buses come out and hang out, you might have a chance to meet the band before uh, they got on the bus. So we went around to the back of the building and we found 
the bus port, I guess. But there was a security guard or two there and we weren't really sure how close we should get. And so we were kind of standing back a bit. And then the first bus came out with black curtains on the window. So we couldn't see anything. And we were like, oh, oh, they're leaving now. So, so we should try to get a little closer. And then the second bus and a third bus came out. And then after that, the security guards went inside and closed the door and that was it. We thought, wow, okay. Well, I guess we uh, stood outside like fools and nothing happened. Well, all right. So off we went to the bus stop and found there were no more buses. And we were down at the Pacific Coliseum in Vancouver, which is quite a distance away from the nearest SkyTrain station. And I think we figured out that if we hadn't missed the last train already, by the time we walked to the station, we certainly would have missed it. So I had to call my dad from a payphone and tell him, yeah, we're standing down here outside the Pacific Coliseum. <laughs> Is it possible for you to come pick us up? So my dad took the 45 minute drive from my home to come out and pick us up. And I remember he wasn't super angry or anything. I think he understood <laughs> our foolishness and said, you know, you, you guys should have just come back after the concert. It was kind of a silly thing for you to do. However, you did the right thing by calling me to come and get you. So I think my dad was super cool that way. He was super cool about so many things in my life. So yeah. So for my best friend, Eugene, one of the fond memories together of our concert going days, Boston's third stage. I told you the stories were long. So from here, there are so many people I could pick but um, I'm going to tell a slightly different story here. So in the mid 90s, I was in a happy relationship. I had a job that I liked. I was getting my photographs published in magazines and I felt the future looked bright. And then something happened. I, I, I went from having some photos published to the next year having more photos published to getting a lot of rejections or getting magazines returning my stuff saying we were going to publish it, but we're ceasing publication with our next issue so we're returning your stuff and it was really disappointing and i thought if this is not working out like i i gave up going to college in order to pursue photography if this doesn't work out i'm happy with my job now but i don't want to stay there the rest of my life and i started to feel like should i go back to college what do i need to do and i felt this um this, uh, you know, kind of worried about being locked down in my life. And I was already settling in in some play ways. And I just thought, you know, I'm 25. I don't, I don't feel I'm ready to be locked into having just, this is my regular job. And this is, you know, who I come home to every day. And as it so happened, um, I had this kind of connection with Japan in the back of my mind for the longest time, probably because I had a playmate when I was in the second and third grade, who was a, a Japanese girl named Yoko, whose family, I guess, were just staying in Canada temporarily, probably due to her father's business. And she lived in, in my hometown and went to my school for two years. Incidentally, the house that she lived in was where I took guitar lessons from my guitar teacher several years later. But um, yeah, after two years, she had to move away and I didn't see her. But somehow, because of her, I think Japan was always in the back of my mind. And then there in the summer of 86, I met a Japanese girl and well, things just led to things. And I realized, I kind of felt like that is my key. That is my gate to getting away from this feeling that I have, like just everything is just settling in too quickly, too fast for me. And so I, you know, from there on took the steps that I needed to take in order to get over to Japan. Of course, a lot of people were saying, why do you have to do it and uh, come back soon and uh, don't stay away too long, whatever. But um, yeah, 25 years later, here I am. <laughs> but anyway, uh, one of the first things I did as I began preparing myself um, for what I needed to do to get over here was I wanted to check out some Japanese bands. And I remembered seeing on Much Music on their international video, one of their international video episodes, a Japanese band called Shonen Knife which was a power pop punk band of three women. And so I went to the store and I found this album here, Shona Knife. This is the Birds uh, and the B-Sides, which is a bunch of B-Sides or alternate versions or whatever from some of their, their songs or from their albums. And this was my first Shona Knife purchase. And aside from Loudness, Thunder in the East, 
This was my first uh, Japanese album purchase. It is all sung in English. Uh, let's see here. The Carpenters uh, song, Top of the World, Shona Knife covered on here. And I loved that song. And so, yeah, I introduced it to, to the girl at the time. But I'm not picking this album specifically for her. I'm picking this album for coming over to Japan and starting that whole new life. And I can't say if leaving Canada meant, you know, I don't know what I gave up. I don't know what my future would have had for me had I stayed. I don't know what events would have taken place. But anyway, from now coming over here, it's been an adventure. There've been a lot of opportunities that I don't think I would have had in Canada. But of course, there also are a lot of difficulties especially being a sole breadwinner in a family of four, <laughs> which is where we are now. So there it is, Shona Knife, the birds and the b-sides, not for anyone in particular, but just basically for everyone I have met since making that decision to come over here. Um, all the Japanese friends I made, the students I've taught over the years, the people I've worked with over the years, it's all for them. <laughs> okay, so there you go. Of course, a long video, don't do them quick usually. But that's the end of my five albums, and that is for Alex at Beer and Vinyl. Coming up to 500 subscribers. Congratulations, Alex. Everybody else, thanks for watching and listening. Alex, thanks for watching and listening, too, if you did. <laughs> okay, hopefully you did. And catch you all uh, in another video soon. Bye, everyone.